We are joined by Everton and Ireland legend Kevin Sheedy. Kevin, uh, welcome back to Dublin. Um, now you're over for the, uh, well basically for the Euro 2020 qualifying draw. There's a lot of events happening including the National Football Exhibition and uh, also just street football that's happening as well. Um, I hadn't, hadn't actually realised you were in Saudi Arabia recently, at least uh, for about a year or so. Was it just uh, coaching? Yeah, just coaching. Uh, I got the opportunity. Uh, it was something completely different. I, I was a, a academy coach for ten years at Everton, which I which I loved. But it was just sometimes, you know, you, you need a little bit of a change. You get to a little bit stale. And a friend of mine uh, got a coaching job over there and said, "Would well, I like to go over?" So something that uh, I went over. Um, really enjoyed it. Different culture, totally different way of life, and uh, the football's the same in any any country so uh, I enjoyed working with the players um, and it's an experience I look back on uh, I'm really glad that I did it yeah, it was Mike Newell, wasn't it, who uh, invited you over? Yes, indeed. Yeah, he was the, the head of coaching over there, and there was um, a coaching role available over there. So I'm good friends with Mike, so it was uh, an easy decision to make. So, as I say, we both really enjoyed it, and it was a, a, fr- a great experience. Uh, adaptation as well. There's a few different types of things that you need to adapt to over there in terms of like the football side and the weather particularly, because the heat, I can imagine, is something we're not used to on this side of the world. So in terms of training times and things, I guess it's like late evening, etc. Indeed, yes. You sort of train at uh, seven o'clock. The games mostly over there uh, were like eight o'clock at night, where it's a lot cooler. Uh, the, the heat in midday is, is really uh, baking, so you, you stay away from any sort of training then. So yeah, so as I say, you adapt to it. Your lifestyle changes, and uh, as I say, you know it, it was a good standard of football, uh, real good, good, good players to work with. So uh, as I say, experience I look back on, and I'm glad that I did. Yeah. Um, so during your time there, obviously you could see Premier League games because they do broadcast them there. How about Ireland games? Were you keeping an eye on Martin O'Neill, Roy Keane regime and just how that developed over time? Obviously there were good moments and then it just seemed to decline. Yeah, I mean, obviously you watch as many games as you can. You've got a lot of spare time on your hands. So uh, obviously uh, keen to see how, the, how t- both Everton and Ireland are doing. So, uh, you know, they, they had a lot of success, Martin and Roy, um, you know, five years sort of thing. So sometimes in football, you know, a change is needed, a different voice for the players. And, uh, you know, everyone starts from fresh. And, uh, you know, I'm sure Mick, um, he's had the experience of doing the job before. He's a great lad and I, I know Mick well. And I'm sure he'll be, he'll be a great success for Ireland again. Yeah. Um, now, the way the FAI have worked it out, it's basically Mick McCarthy taking it on until 2020 and then Stephen Kenny uh, following up after that. Um, have you ever seen something like that in football where the, you know, the next manager already has a next manager in place after? Um, probably the last that maybe did that was Liverpool in the, the late 70s, early 80s, where they had uh, Bob Paisley, Big Bill Shankly, Bob Paisley, Joe Fagan, Roy Evans. So there was a conveyor belt there that they all learned their trade. Uh, so probably in the modern game, you don't really really see that. So I'm sure the, the, the FAI have, have studied it really hard and, and they put that uh, plan in progress. Um, had you followed much of what Stephen Kenny had done at Dundalk or were you kind of... was? Is a kind of kind of learning from afar now and seeing well maybe looking back at what he's done and maybe trying to see how he can apply that to uh, international football. Yeah, he's, he's got good experience. He's, he's been successful in Ireland, so obviously the the the. They've put him in a position where he's going to obviously coach the the end of twenty ones and then eventually become the the island manager. So you know time will tell, but I'm sure the FAI have, have done their homework and you know hopefully they've made the right decision. Yeah, um, and obviously it, there's a bit of a devil's advocate thing to this here now because uh, everyone's kind of wondering how this like what risks there are in terms of whether this will work or not. Um, let's just say Mick McCarthy does well, and maybe by our standards, that's just get like getting us to the Euros and maybe getting to the knockout stage, and that would be a huge success given where we are now. Um, and maybe you know there'd be a clamour for him to stay on. Um, that's obviously a massive risk. Uh, where would you stand on it? There, do you think maybe there would be there should be kind of a clause maybe that Mick McCarthy is allowed to stay on, and maybe the Stephen Kenny you know succession successions maybe pushed back a little bit. Um, well, I'm not sure the real. Th- you know, thought behind what the decision made, but I'm sure the FAI would love that uh, decision to make. That Mick's been really successful, got us through the qualifying. You know, gone as far as we can go, and then then see from there. Yeah, and from the other point as well, say things don't go too well, and then obviously there will be a clamour then maybe for Stephen Kenny to come in earlier. Can you envisage that uh, happening as well? Um, time will tell. Uh, as I say, Mick's a, an experienced manager. Uh, I'm sure he'd be successful, um, and hopefully, fingers crossed that he is successful. And then the FAI have a, a tough decision. To make. Yeah. 
Um, I suppose moving on to uh, your own Ireland career as well, leading up to Euro 88 when we first qualified for a major tournament. Uh, when you first came into the camp, so this is in the the early 80s, um, what was the situation like at that point? Because we hadn't qualified for anything and we seemed quite far away from, you know, be getting to major tournaments, uh, particularly given the fact there weren't as many teams able to qualify as well. Indeed, it was different. Um, I mean, I played for, for the youth team when I was 16, so I played right the way through. Uh, at that time, Ireland had a lot of very good players, but didn't really blend as a, as a team. I think it was only until Jack Charlton came in that um, he really got the players uh, a style of football that he wanted to play. Uh, but it was a style of football that he had good players to play the way that he wanted. And uh, we had a great team spirit um, and got on really well. Uh, and it's nice to, to meet up with the, the, the players from that era. Yeah. Um, in terms of the style of play that we would have had under, say, Ho- Owen Hand uh, before the big or before Big Jack's um, era, so obviously Big Jack's era was kind of put him under pressure, um, not so much a long ball game, but just trying to press the opposition in the opposition half, get balls in early. Um, were, was Owen Hand the type of manager that kind of had a set philosophy in terms of trying to build from the back, or what way was it at the time? Uh, probably a bit more playing from the back uh, through midfield. We had Liam Brady, world class player, so everything went through Liam, um, and then th- that was that style. Obviously, when Jack came in, it was a different style. But when you're playing a bit longer balls, when you've got the the quality of Steve Thornton's left foot, you've got Dennis Irwin, and Chris Hewton, quality with their right foot. It wasn't more a long ball; it was a long ball with quality, and everybody bought into the the work ethic of, of closing teams down. International teams weren't used to being closed down in their half. When you lost the ball, uh, ev- team just drop back and let the, the opposition have the ball it was totally different and uh, Jack's system and it was uh, it was successful it was very successful um, and everyone bought into it as I said yeah like pressing is obviously something that we see a lot at club level because team or managers have time to implement that uh, that game plan so how did Big Jack manage to do that um, given that he didn't always have you around it's always around international breaks like to actually plan implement that pressing was a kind of basically you see your opposition member you you go and press or was there something a little bit more planned around it not really no I think it's it's sort of um, Barcelona do it you know the nearest player to the ball when you lose it go and close down I think that was the what we had and at the end at the end of the day the the players in that squad all played for the top teams, so we were used to playing in big games for our clubs. So coming to play international football, we were used to playing as in those uh, experience in those big games. So I think that certainly helped us. Yeah, and the 1986 World Cup qualifying campaign. Then we were behind. I think um, Denmark, great Denmark team, the Danish Dynamite. I think they still call them now the Soviet Union, and then the Swiss. So we were quite far away from you know what would then be qualifying for Euro 88 and the 1990 World Cup. Um, what do you think went wrong during that campaign? And then what did Big Jack really look to implement and change then um, to try and actually close that gap? I think what we just talked about before, just the style of football, uh, a change in personnel. Um, it was in those days, it was Jack's way or the highway. Uh, he certainly had to put the, the work ethic in. Uh, he didn't want the, the back players playing into midfield to lose possession. So it, it's, it's over a period of time, he, he drummed in what his beliefs were, and the players, as I say, bought into it. And uh, the, the difference then from obviously the 86, as you said, to then qualifying for 88 was, uh, was the difference in the style of play. Yeah, and in 86, there was, a, I think they call it the Icelandic triangle angular tournament um, which took place in Iceland and Ireland actually it's the first time we ever won anything I think we beat Iceland in Czechoslovakia I think uh, who was it uh, there was Paul McGrath definitely scored in the first game and then Daly as well Derek Daly um, or not sorry not Derek Daly but uh, Jerry, uh, Jerry Daly, Daly yeah. sorry yeah in the in the second game or in the uh, second goal in that game um, you weren't part of that squad no, no I, think. I, I was injured at the time yeah. so I missed out on that so obviously um, different players came in and so as you say it's the first, first time Ireland won something yeah and it was kind of the first time Jack had had the team together um, before that campaign for Euro 88 um, obviously looking at it from afar um this was kind of the first point, I guess, where that I suppose a lot of the um, the game plans and things were implemented. Um, were some of your t- Ireland teammates at the time kind of telling you about some of the changes being made during that tournament? Um, I think you find out for yourself, really. I mean, obviously, you get together and you, you chat with the lads, and you know, what, you know what Jack was like and what he wanted. So I think you, you were clever enough to take the information on board that what Jack wanted, and uh, as I say, the players implemented. You know, the likes of Paul McGrath was a world class player, uh, Andy Townsend, Ray Houghton, uh, John Aldrich, Cascarino. You know, you know, great players in in the team, uh, and we all came together and gelled. Mm. 
And was there a belief as well? Because once you get to Euro 88, like, I mean, you've qualified for the first time and then you're coming up against some of the great teams, that Dutch team, that had Van Basten, um, Rod Hullet, etc. England had some strong players. Um, Soviet Union was still, when they got to the final that year, particularly strong. But did you kind of believe you could compete at the same level as those teams? I think so, yes, definitely. Because when you looked around and, as I say, all the players in our squad and our team were playing for the, the top teams and I think you look back I mean Holland and, and Russia got to the final uh, we should have beaten Russia uh, Holland they scored six minutes from time otherwise we'd have qualified um, and who knows so I think we, we got a lot of belief from the from the Euros the qualifying games the actual games itself and then that, that helped us obviously going on to the, the World Cup in 1990 Yeah and there's no better way than galvanising yourself for a game against England Indeed, I mean, uh, it was a, a big pressure game, but it was like a local derby because everybody was used to playing against each other. So I, I was playing against Gary Stevens, who I played with for Everton. So Trevor Stevens. So I, they, we knew each other inside out. So it was always going to be uh, not a negative game, but sort of we, we snuffed each other out. Sort of, and it was always going to be a, a close encounter. Yeah, I think the last time we spoke um, on the radio on Team 33, um, obviously if we just forward on to the 1990 World Cup. So your famous goal against England. I know you once mentioned that uh, it did bring people together in terms of the marriage sense um, and you did meet people like that were there other people as well that have come out of the woodwork to <laughs> claim that you've uh, brought love into their life oh indeed yes I mean uh, the usual cats and dogs are named after you and, and different stories like I said about uh, people you know hugging and kissing when I scored and going out with each other and getting married um, so yeah it's just you don't realise at the time you're just going out you're doing your job you're playing football so uh, looking back fantastic memories the whole 88 and the whole 90 uh, was, was, a, was a great time for our Irish football and I'm so pretty privilege to have been part of that. Yeah, I suppose just to switch to Everton actually because there is a Merseyside derby coming up and uh, you had your fair share of good memories in that fixture um, the way Marco Silva has actually developed the team it seems to have worked slowly now and they seem to be getting somewhere they're above Manchester United in the table they're in the top six um, are you surprised at uh, how quickly seem things seem to have turned around in the last few weeks? I think there's been a lot of transition over the last three years at the club different managers different personnel and I think it's recently uh, is the first time the managers had this full squad of players players available to him and certainly the, f the style of football um, I've really enjoyed watching them I know the supporters have enjoyed uh, we're probably a couple of players short of probably galvanizing a top six place but certainly if we can you know add, add to the squad that we've got um, he's made some great buys uh, Rick Carlison, I know 40 million is a lot of money but uh, he looks a top player um, he's only 21 um, Gomez in midfield on loan from Barcelona he's a, he's a top class player hopefully we, we can uh, sign him permanently Jordan Pickford you know his distribution um, is tremendous so we've got the backbone and the makings of, of a real good side there and I think with a couple of additions as I say I think the for the first time in a while the Evertonians are really looking forward to to the team and watching the team that we're yeah. you know playing the football that we're playing there seems to be a gap at centre forward now Richardson has actually been uh, you know he's been scoring a few goals but he's not a kind of a no, or like he, I suppose your regular centre forward he's kind of he's a, he's a forward of a, of a different sort kind of plays out wide um, is that an area you kind of want urgently fixed at this point I think so I think if it's with Carlison, I mean, he just drifts in off the left, and he, he he can get in the back post. He can score with his head. He can score with his left foot, right foot. He's got you know, he's got the armory to do it. Uh, as an out and out number nine, then I don't think I think the manager's worked with him. He knows he's not an out and out striker. So I think we need we need some um, some additions in the, in the attacking uh, system to to help him and really really flourish. And Seamus Coleman's form, like obviously he had the uh, the really bad injury um, that we can sustained against Wales back in uh, back in the World Cup qualifiers, and I don't think he seems he doesn't seem to have kind of recaptured it fully. Um, is that a concern, particularly with the age he is at at the moment? I think he's done fantastic fantastic to get back to, to where he is at the moment it was a horrific injury um, I remember years ago uh, Jim Beglin had a similar injury um, and it's really career threatening so for Seamus to get back and to perform like he's performing at the moment because sometimes you know people have to remember that when he got his injury he was at the height of his career and it takes a little bit of time to, to get back there um, he's, he's a great player really determined gives it all he's got and, and his, his performances are improving and I'm sure he'll get back to, to where he was before he had the injury yeah I suppose a final question. Um, 
Everton haven't, haven't had as much luck against Liverpool in the head-to-head fixtures in quite a while. Um, is that the sort of thing that can actually get caught up in the mind of a player, you know, records, or is that something that maybe they're able to overlook? But, um, and maybe I'm actually talking more about players who've been in the squad for a long time. I think if you look at the, the squad that we've got, there's a lot of yeah, new players in the team, which will be the first or second derby. So I don't think any of that mind games will, will be involved. You know, they won't look back at the history of, of what, you know, the certain decisions or whatever. They'll just go out there. Uh, we're playing with confidence. We're on a good run. Uh, difficult place to go to. Uh, Liverpool are playing well. They've had a bit of a hiccup with the, the result against PSG. But there's never a good time or a bad time. Derby games, form goes, goes out the window and it's who does well on the day and hopefully Everton do better on the day. We'll, we'll certainly see it the weekend. Kevin, thanks a million for your time. My pleasure. Thanks very much. Thank you.